All right, thanks everybody. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how questions are gonna come in, but I really like open formats. Um, this is a lot of information we're gonna go over. Um, we're trying to make insurance Oh, it's such a boring topic for most, but we want to make it some, uh, hopefully have some fun with it. And um, because there's a lot of importance to it. Uh, just give you a little background. I've been in the industry for over 31 years. Um, I am currently the VP of agency development at our organization and do a lot of these presentations and uh, continuing education um, within uh, our, our organization. So I'm hoping the information I share can be helpful to you. Initially, um, I want to, we have to go through these disclaimers because I need to kind of CYA. And um, this PowerPoint information is, is for informational purposes only. And if there's questions, I'm just gonna go through this real quick is regarding your policy or terminology with contracts. Um, you've got to refer to your, the, the person that's handling your insurance or an attorney because there's differences in insurance policies. So I'm gonna give you a big kind of overview of them, but every policy has its own little quirks and, and policy provisions and conditions and so forth, okay? So just, at, just out of curiosity, when questions come in, how do I see them or? You know, uh, this is Brad. I will keep an eye on the chat box. And okay. when you ask me if there's any questions, I'll let you know what they are. Okay, perfect, okay. all right. So as an insurance guy, what I usually do when I sit down with a, a client is I start showing them all the ways they can get sued. Isn't that a fun conversation? And then what we try and do is, is, is outline all these exposures that you may have, or not all of them, but some high level exposures, and then start to plug those with insurance and different risk transfer. And so we're gonna kind of build up on this and kind of show where people are exposed some problems that uh, we see within the industry and how to ho hopefully overcome them. So initially, when you look at um, some where claims arise, premises is the big one, the typical slip and falls. Um, liability arising out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of a location that you're on. Products, liability arising out of the injury or damage caused by defects in product design manufacture or failure to warn or explain, especially as vendors um, or anybody, you know, the, the, the last presenter, um, everything she's putting out there, our product. If somebody ingests um, or has something topical um, and causes any type of bodily injury or harm to somebody, that's going to be a product liability claim. And so as you're putting pr produce or any other products or sauces or foods out there in the marketplace, that's uh, gonna be a product liability issue. Typical operations, your everyday operations, especially if you've got um, um, your injury or damages caused by activities that are going on for your normal operations. Operations and the slip and falls kind of tie in together. Automobile, liability rising out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of an auto. And there's a big question out there uh, and, and something you get really got to look at when you're using your personal auto for commercial use or business use. There's a lot of personal auto policies out there that may exclude any business use. So if you're using a, your, your personal vehicle, whether it be a truck or a car, to, to pull a, a food trailer, or to run errands. So it's really important to understand if your current auto policy is gonna cover business use. And so just call your insurance agent, ask them, and tuck it in the file. So if there's ever a problem, you can, you can have documentation that says, hey, I got, you know, I had this conversation with an XYZ agent, he said I'd be covered. So that's a really big one, because I see a lot of problems there when people are using personal versus their commercial auto. Trailers, the bodily injury or property damage arising from the ownership, maintenance, use, or entrustment to others are excluded from general liability. So usually when the vehicle, whatever vehicle is towing the trailer, the liability for the trailer falls under the vehicle policy. That's kind of typical. 
But what happens when you set the food trailer up or the food cart or whatever, if somebody gets hurt, hits their head, trips over a tongue, on that trailer, you have an exposure there. So it's really important to understand that if that trailer is kind of sitting and it's detached from a vehicle, your general liability policy may not cover injuries that are caused on or around that trailer. One thing that we do at FLIP is we designed a specific trailer endorsement that adds that coverage back on. So that's what makes us a little bit different than others out there. You know, employees are always the biggest asset to the company, but they are also can be a very detrimental to a company. Um, Work-related injuries, and we're gonna get into work comp um, and some work-related injuries that uh, may or may not be covered. Theft, fraud, harassment, discrimination, creating hostile work environments, wage and hour claims, wrongful termination. So if you're not handling employees correctly, that can come back on you and create problems that you may have to come in and defend and, and pay out for any type of, the, any type of these um, allegations that may be caused against you. So where our employees are the biggest asset, you also got to understand that they can be a little bit of a liability, especially when it goes south and you may fire somebody and they can come back after you for some of these reasons. We good got so far? Got a question for you, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, so Charles asks, we keep our farmer's market supplies in a construction trailer, but we've had problems finding insurance because it might be towed by several different people or personnel vehicles. Yeah, so the, the trailer, um, there's two parts of that that I'm, I'm thinking of. The trailer itself um, may be covered under an inland marine, a commercial inland marine policy. Um, that would cover the physical damage in case the trailer had an overturn or there was a collision or was stolen. Um, you may also be able to get good, the goods covered inside under what they call an inland marine policy. The liability aspect is going to fall on the vehicle that's towing it. Now, insurance companies get a little crazy um, because when they when they feel like they're losing control, meaning you're you're led you're letting me use the trailer and then the next guy use the trailer and whoever uses trailer, they, they consider that out of your control. And so they get a little more twisted up about trying to find insurance for it. But I, if you search for a commercial inland marine policy, as long as you're not renting it out, um, which may, uh, may, may or may not be the case, you could probably get coverage for that. Is that helpful? Thanks, Chris. Yep. Okay, other things that can cause you problems, independent contractors, and I, we see this a lot in a lot of different industries, but people will, don't want to hire employees, and so we said, hey, we're just going to bring out independent contractors and subcontractors, and they're going to work for us. Well, pro there's a lot of problems that can be caused with that. One is those independent contractors aren't covered under your general liability policy. They're not an insured. Um, like your employees are. And I pulled up some Alaska law, um, and it says to, to determine whether a person is an independent contractor or an employee, it is important to consider all the evidence regarding the degree of control and independence. So what it really comes down to is what are you asking the independent contractor to do? Because depending on what you're stating, you may have just turned that independent contractor into an employee. And then there's different employee laws that you may not be following. So independent contractors should perform duties that are not part of the normal workflow. Perform a task that has a specific result or end date. Expect to receive income from more than one source. Have a business license have a premise, a business premises, and provide services to more than one employer. So we're gonna, the next slide we get into, it's talking about even more detail about what an independent contractor is. Possession of a business license or insurance does not make a valid independent contractor. 
there, these are only beginning steps. There are a number of factors that make a worker an employee or an independent contractor. So what it comes down to is what kind of instructions are you giving this person that is technically a independent contractor or you're trying to title an independent contractor. An employee is generally subject to the business instructions about when, where, and how to work. All of the following are examples of types of instruction about how to do the work. When and where to do the work, what tools or equipment to use, what workers to hire or to assist with that work, where to purchase supplies and services, what work must be for, performed by a specific individual, what order or sweet sequence to follow when performing that work. So basically it's saying, if you got somebody coming in as an independent contract, but you're saying, I need you to be here at this time, you have to be here until five o'clock, here's the tools you use, here's, here's our processes, that is not an independent contractor by state law. That is now an employee. And just because you want to deem them in, independent contractors, if you get caught or they get hurt on the job, you're gonna be a little bit in some hot water. So it's really important to understand in every state. So if, you know, these are specific things I pulled from Alaska and you'll see down there the, end of the, the reference to the IRS, but every state has- Hey Chris, you yeah. lost the slideshow there. It just says slideshow, resume slideshow. Sorry. We good there? <laughs> We're good. Okay. Good. Appreciate it. Keep me on my toes. <laughs> um, so you need to be really careful on how you're deeming these independent contractors. Alaska employers who hire independent contractors must provide them and their employees with workers' comp coverage unless the contractor can provide proof of insurance. If you hire an independent contractor or subcontractor who lacks workers' comp insurance and one of their workers get hurt, you may be liable for that person's medical expenses under your own workers' comp arrangement. Here's a scary thing. If you don't have workers' comp, you may be paying it out of your own pocket. And so it's really important that if, that if you have an independent contractor, they're truly independent contractors. Penalties in this case. Employers in Alaska who fail to maintain workers' comp insurance for their employees will be subject to a variety of civil penalties, including penalties up to $1,000 per employee per day in which they fail to provide workers' comp coverage, being shut down by the state, a stop order, a stop work order, having to pay $1,000 in additional penalties for each day they violate a stop work order, being barred from pursuing job contracts with the state of Alaska, and being liable personally to pay benefits for injury or sick employees who should have had workers' comp coverage at the time of their work-related injury or illness. So you can see it gets really important that, again, you know, I know I'm kind of like sitting up on the soapbox, but I see it, you know, in all these industries where people are trying to skirt some of these, you know, they don't want to pay payroll taxes and they don't want to pay work comp and, and these kind of things, but the exposure and the risks that you put to your business by doing this, you can see the penalties can be, be, be pretty stiff. Um, and the biggest one, not being a penalty, but the biggest one is if you have a long-term injury, you're on the hook personally for that. They just totally decimate a, a business or in, in, uh, especially a small business. Uh, possible criminal fines of 10,000 or up to one year. Additional things that can cause you problems, contracts. Now, whether you're a vendor or a, a uh, farmer market manager um, or you're signing a lease, these are all contracts that have terms and conditions in there that you need to pay attention to because they're gonna, they can get you in a little bit of trouble. So liability arising out of indemnification and hold harmless agreements within contracts. <clears throat> so a hold harmless agreement is a contract in which one party agrees to indemnify the other. 
indemnification clause is a contract provision in which one party agrees to answer for any specified or unspecified liability or harm that the other party might incur also in termed hold harmless clauses so i see a lot of times when people say hey can you can you see if my insurance is going to cover this or would you like to look at this contract the hold harmless agreements and indemnification clauses are sometimes just mixed together but what you're doing is saying, if something happens, so I'm a vendor at a farmer's market, and my farmer's market, if I have a contract there, which you should, will say, you're gonna hold, harm anything that happens, you're gonna hold me harmless, the farmer's market, and you're gonna indemnify me if you cause me harm. And those are things in contracts, and you will even see them, and I got some examples here of these, some terminology even in lease agreements. And so, We'll jump into those real quick. So an agreement to identify another is not insurance and has nothing to do with insurance. So you got to remember there's two parts to when you've got a, a contract. One is you have the contract you're signing. The second part is insurance you're purchasing. One does not make the other react but you gotta be aware that there's certain things in the contract, and we'll go over that, that you may be assuming that insurance doesn't cover. By signing a contract, you're not obligating your insurance provider to pay for the indemnification and hold harmless clauses in those contracts, okay? Are we having fun yet? Isn't this just enlightening? It's great. Um, <laughs> There's a question from Eric. Uh, how about sole proprietors uh, and their role of being hired contractors or? Or subcontractors. So whether, if you're a sole proprietor, um, I don't think it, you can get around the laws and you can call, you may want to call your state uh, Department of Labor and ask, but you're still, re, you know, because a sole proprietor is an entity, right? You got sole proprietors, LLCs, and whether you're, bringing an employee on or hiring them as an independent contractor, you fall under those same rules as far as I understand. So if you want more clarification, you might want to just go to the Department of Labor and say, hey, this is my situation. Do I still fall under these same laws? But I, I'm going to say, I think about 90% you're, you're going to be. Um, insurance is completely independent of the obligation and identification, which we kind of talked about. A contractual duty to indemnify and hold harmless is not the legal equivalent of a duty to procure insurance coverage for the indemnity obligations. And I know there's a lot of legalese thrown out there, but it's something, again, you need to be very aware of because, again, when you sign these contracts, whether you're a vendor or a farmer's market or a farmer's market signing with one with, uh, with cities and municipalities, all of this ties in together. Well-written contracts that contain indemnity agreements do not confuse insurance obligation with indemnity clauses, which we already hit about. I need to really, you need to really get in your head that just because you sign a contract doesn't mean insurance is gonna protect you. Um, could you be identifying somebody for things that are not covered? Absolutely. The things you need to be aware of, language that says any and all, any liability, all liability, all claims, without limitation. Um, these are key words that are going to really, you're gonna see in these contracts and as you start looking at contracts or having contracts written on your behalf, you're gonna see all these words come up. And the more that, you know, I'm not beating up on attorneys, but when an attorney's hired, they are hired to protect the person that hired them. And so they're gonna put the, large, the, the broadest language available in there. So here's, a, here's one contract uh, I just pulled from a lease agreement. Tenant hereby identifies and holds the landlord harmless from and against all liabilities, obligations, claims, damages, penalties, cause of actions, costs and expenses, including without limitation, reasonable attorney's fees and expenses at all trial and appellate levels, any, ins any accident, injury, or death of person or loss of damage to property, any act or omission of tenant or anyone claiming by, through or under tenant by any failure on the part of tenant. 
I mean, that is broad. It's basically saying when tenant, when you sign this, I'm pushing all my liability to you. You're going to hold me harmless for everything. And when you look at an insurance policy, the insurance policy doesn't suffer, say we're going to cover you for everything. And so an insurance policy has limitations, conditions, and exclusions. This contract doesn't. So when you're signing these contracts, you just got to realize when it says any incident, all liabilities, that's broad. That's broader than your insurance policy. You're going to be assuming some things on your own if, if this contract is, is broken. Here's another one. Uh, this is actually with a vendor uh, and a farmer market. Vendors shall at all times at its sole expense identify, defend, save, and hold harmless the market and its officers, directors, employees, affiliates, agents, successors, licensees, assigns from all agents and er, from and against any and all claims, liability losses, judgment, damages, and it goes on and on and on about the same kind of verbiage. We're going to, doesn't matter if you're going to breach the contract, you're going to hold us harmless from all kinds of things. There you go. There's all the little, the key words there, from and against any breach and any act of remission. This one is always a fun one. Um, as an insurance guy, if I got this thrown on my desk, I'd run and hide under a rock. Um, each vendor at the market shall at the market agrees to fully identify and hold DLA and DLA officers, employees and agents, and the Department of Defense officers, employees and agents, harmless from any and all claims asserting liabilities, loss, bodily injury, death, or property damage, including settlements, judgment, reasonable attorney's fees, litigation expenses arising from or relating from in any way the vendor's participation in the market. So basically, you're gonna hold the De Department of Defense harmless from any and all claims on your own insurance if you participate in this market. So again, you just gotta realize as a vendor, if you want the job, here's the reality. I mean, it, this is the real world. If the vendor wants to be a part of this, they've gotta sign the contract. If the farmer's market wants to be part and it, to be able to hold their, their market in a specific area, they're gonna be signing contracts with the venue or the municipality, and this kind of language is in there. Can you negotiate out of it? Sometimes. Can you redline things? Sure, and I would try, but you need to get, I would say you need an attorney to look these things over and just so you understand those things that you may be holding people harmless and indemnifying for, so you're just aware. Hey, Chris, we've got a couple questions for you. Sure, go ahead. Uh, from Jonathan, workman's comp laws for licensed contractor with no employees, is that a, Kind of related to the previous uh, so workers workers comp laws for, for for a licensed contractor without any employees if or um, they're required is that a state to state situation um so i'm, I'm not i'm going to try and answer this and hopefully it's answering what they want if if i got a true subcontractor that has workers comp and they're coming on my premises and working for me that's not a problem I think the problem that we get into is if we are trying to, as a, uh, a business or a sole proprietor, bring people on that I don't want to pay as an employee and I don't want to hold the responsible as an employee and I don't want to pay workers comp and you know unemployment benefits and all that stuff, but I'm mandating them as an employee to do all their job and their work, that's where I think the problem is going to be. So, True independent contractor comes in, not a problem. I, and I, I don't know if that answered the question or not. Great, well, I'm not sure either, but we'll take that, you said yes. All right, okay. good. Okay, what's the other question? It is, uh, are all insurance companies requiring each vendor to hold insurance? It didn't used to be the case, but it now seems more difficult for a market to find insurance that doesn't require each vendor to hold their own. That's from Sarah Dylan Jensen. Yeah, um, so what happens is um, anytime, well, okay. I've talked to a lot of farmers markets that are not as strict as others, but for the majority of it, when they become 
oh, I don't want to use this word, but it's the only thing that comes to my head. <laughs> kind of like they're trying to be legitimate. Then they talk to attorneys and say, how do I protect myself? We're going to get into this risk transfer stuff. And then that attorney says, you need to have everybody carry insurance to protect you. And then we're going to get into additional insureds. So they're pushing this liability downstream, which ends up in the, you know, in the vendor. So yes, I'm seeing more and more vendors required to, to carry liability insurance to participate in these farmers markets. Hey, Brad, um, I've got a question for you relating to this up there in Alaska. What, you know, what, what would you say roughly of the, of the 50 plus farmers markets that are going on up there? How many do you think require insurance of their vendors? Of course, all the farmers market managers have to have insurance, but what about their vendors? I think it's a high percentage. Um, definitely of uh, the more established markets. I think it's a common practice here in Alaska. And one of the things is, you know, uh, that we see and get asked for is there's, you know, um, do I buy my own policy or do I buy a, a, a tenant's unit? It's called a tulip policy or this master plan. Um, and there's pros and cons to both, but under the under the group policy, it's kind of like the the um, promoter or the manager is buying insurance for everybody coming in there. But if there's claims, it can affect that entire policy and that, that market manager's kind of status with insurance companies as they go forward and try and buy other policies. And, and the con is that that policy is not portable for the vendor. And so, the, you know, if they go to another show and they don't have the, they're not covered under the tulip policy, they got to get their own anyway. So to me, it's better to buy individual policies as a vendor so that wherever I go, I've got coverage. And I wanna make, this is kind of off, off this a little bit, but during these times right now with the virus and everything, people are really struggling, you know. Um, we know events are canceled, we do a lot of these events. And one of the things they wanna let go is the insurance. Um, but I want to throw this out here and then I'll continue on the presentation. One of the things you need to consider is if you have product in the market, that exposure doesn't go away. And the way the policies are designed, you're not covered when, the pol when, the, when your product was manufactured. You have to have coverage in force when the claim happens. And so if I produced sauces last six months ago and I got them on the shelves, and I decide when I cancel my policy today to ride the storm out, and somebody ingests that and gets sick, if I've canceled my policy and they've filed a claim, there's no coverage there. And so you, be, you need to be really cognizant on when you're going to, if you're going to play with your insurance, is be, do I have exposure out there that could come back and hurt me? So just food for thought. So, okay, risk, so yeah. I'm sorry, I'll let you go. Uh, so let Sarah just had a follow up question about. Uh, your company would be willing to insure a market that did not want to require that of their vendors? Probably not. Um, I would probably, I would probably suggest going a, a tulip policy and, and probably try to talk to the ma the market managers say, Hey, well, if you're not going to require insurance, why don't we buy an insurance policy and maybe pass the cost down to them? Uh, the other question I would ask is why is a farmer's market? And I understand, you know, you got a lot of small vendors and things like that, mom and pop shops, but, you know, that's what makes the, these really work is this extra cost sometimes is, is difficult, but as a market manager or personally, are you willing to take on all the risk of another entity um, or individual or product? And that's, that's kind of the two-edged sword is, and we're going to get into the risk management is if you're not willing to pass that risk on, you got to say, I'm okay accepting it because if they don't have insurance, you're going to pay. That's just the way our legal system is. And if you're okay going, I'm willing to take it on the chin for all these people, then that's a choice you make. Thanks. That definitely answered the question. Thank you. Okay. So basically, you know, we've kind of talked about all these things. Um, we've identified some 
problematic areas. Now we got to say, well, what are we going to do with them? And so when you're talking about what do I do with these exposures, these risks, I can avoid it, I can reduce it, I can accept it, or I can transfer it. And so we're going to talk about more of acceptance and transfer as we move forward. So if I'm going to transfer risk, I've identified my exposure. So let's say, you know, let's talk about our vendors. I'm a market manager. I got all my vendors out there. I've identified that they could cause me problems. So as we talked before, I can accept it or retain it, meaning I don't do anything. And I just know that if there's a problem, it might come and fall on my head. That's one, one way to do it. Or I can transfer it, which we've talked about some of that. I have a non-insurance transfer, which I do with contracts, which we've gone through. And you can see that we're saying, hey, we're gonna, I'm gonna make all the vendors um, sign this contract and they're gonna hold me harmless and I'm gonna have additional insurance status. And that is what they call a non-insurance transfer. And then we could, or we could outsource work. The other way to transfer is through insurance. So we buy an insurance policy to get the right coverage. So in case something happens, that I have enough money coming in to satisfy a claim that will establish limits and will have specific types of retention. What, what, and a retention is just another name for a deductible. So you've either got to, when, you, when you're looking at it again, you say, I'm good with it, I'll accept it, or I'm gonna start doing things to transfer it. And most people are in the transfer stage. So we talked about contracts. So the contracts you're signing, what risk are you accepting? So we already talked about carefully review your contracts you sign, have legal counsel review them. Um, what won't be covered by my insurance and the hold harmless agreements? And we need to review the additional insurance statuses. And then be informed on what risks you are assuming. When you've got contracts you ask others to sign, so now you're transferring this risk. And there's some key tools when you're transferring risk. It's not just a matter of we're going to have contracts signed. You should probably have some policy and procedures to think about to make sure that the people that you're um, transferring the risk to is actually doing something. So you've got to have uh, some of the things you may want to consider is secure signed contract before work begins or leases start. Um, oral contracts and handshake deals can be difficult and costly to enforce. Um, have an attorney draft your contract and include hold harmless agreements to protect you. Require you as a named insured on the policy and clearly, clearly define each party's responsibilities. And I think you have to have somebody trained to understand what a certificate looks like, and we're going to go over that, and, and be able to approve them and retain these contracts and certificates in a file for a period of, you know, five to seven years. Because especially with product liability, we see product liability claims going seven to 10 years uh, before some claims come in. So it's really important to be able to pull that information back to protect yourself or to, to fall back on that. So a lot of you have probably been requested to be named as additional insured or other people have asked you to put them as an additional insured. So we're gonna talk about what that is. Um, so an additional insured is a company that is added to a policyholders or your policy and is considered an additional insured. This endorsement can complement an existing contract and help protect a party from liability arising out of another party's negligence. And we'll get into that a little bit again um, and, and talk about how this will work. And additional insurers are only covered for operations that involve the named insured in some way. So for example, if I'm a vendor and I'm at a, you know, a farmer market and I have my contract signed, I'm holding them harmless, I got additional insured status, the only way the additional insured is gonna pay is if for some reason my product or my operations cause somebody harm in our litigious system, they're gonna sue me, they're gonna sue the farmer's market, they're gonna sue the city, they're gonna sue everybody out there to see what's gonna stick. Well, because you're getting sued, the farmer's market's getting sued for my operations, that's where my additional insured or my policy is gonna pay for that additional insured. 
And if the farmer's market has named the city's additional insured, the farmer's market's gonna policy is gonna protect them. And so it kind of flows up and downstream. So when you start adding additional insurance to the policy, you're basically giving them all the rights to your policy limits, and they have the same policy limitations exclusions. Um, and it's important to know that additional insured status is different than a certificate holder. A certificate holder is a person that is only provided for, it's, it's a proof of insurance. It really has no teeth. It just lets you know that the person that gave you the certificate of insurance as a certificate holder just has insurance. Whereas an additional insured gives you all the rights to that policy um, if they're brought into a suit due to the, the negligence of that vendor. Questions? I know this is a lot thrown at you, especially especially via this, <laughs> this format. I think people are just chewing right now. Digesting. They're probably just, they're probably glossy eyed <laughs> chewing. They're probably just, the eyes are rolling back in their head going, what the hell just happened to me? <laughs> well, hey, look, I see some wine in one there. So that's, that's what we're That's doing. good. That's this, good. We've got about does, five minutes left here. Yeah. It looks I'm like there to... is a couple questions though. Okay. So let me finish this with additional insurance. So I'm going to say mine is the vendor. Theirs is the, uh, is, is the farmer's market. So you've got, you've got this shared liability, right? Here. Oh, what happened there? You got the shared liability here that that's where you come into this contractual obligation or you're sharing this liability because you're attending that farmer's market. And that's where the additional insurance is going to pay. What's the, what's the questions you have? So a question from Donna Ray and Homer uh, for a small farm trying to make it all work. So how about the structure of a small farm 1099ing a farm laborer under a contract and the farm providing workers comp for them? And two, if you have that laborer accompany you to farmer's market, it all seems like the best lawyer wins. This is a lot. <laughs> well, she's got a point there. Um, so as far as getting uh, granular on, especially when it's farm labor, I'll have to just say, I don't know. I wish I could give you the right answer um, because I think, and, and again, I'm just going out on a limb, but I'm just digging deep in my memory. I think farm labor has some different stipulations to that. So they're, you're just gonna have to, again, call the Department of Labor and ask them. But it's true that sometimes the, the, the attorney that has the most information can tell the better story does win. I mean, unfortunately. Looks like Jonathan also had a question. Okay. Um, yeah. He said, how many, how many additional insurers are allowed per license? So additional insurers, I mean, you can put an unlimited amount on there. Um, sometimes, and you've got to just talk to your insurance company because some additional insurers are free. Sometimes they're going to charge you for them. It all depends on the additional insurer. And because of the time, we are not going to get through everything. Um, so what I'm going to do is... We're, 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 some... actually, we're actually going to have a breakout session right after this. So those okay. that want to continue with and go over these questions as well. Um, okay, so... So. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump real quick. These are additional insured endorsements. Um, and I'm not going to go through them just for because of time. And But what I want to do is hit on this. The certificate of insurance. If you're, especially if you're a market manager, it's really important to understand these certificates of insurance and not just get it in the throat in the file. Um, and so I'm going to, I, this is the whole one. I'm going to break it out in sections. So when you're reviewing a certificate of insurance, you're going to have the insured name right there, and you got to make sure that that's right, number one. And then it's really important to see under this insurer A, the name of the insurance company, because later on, we're going to refer to that in the certificate. So right here, where it says A, that's where we're referring it to. So under insurance letter is A. So if you have three or four insurance companies under that list, these numbers can appear in different areas. The other thing you want to make sure is that the general liability is an occurrence form so that these both of these boxes are checked, that you have the policy number and the effective dates of the policy, and that these, this is where your insurance limits appear, and that the insurance limits are matching what you require. Sometimes, you know, if you're requiring, a lot of times these markets will require higher liability limits or a vendor might, or like a 
a Whole Foods, if you're in there, might require a five million limit. And so you would have other limits listed down at the bottom here uh, to, to meet those obligations. Um, here's where it says the certificate holder is listed as additional insured. And then here is your certificate holder down there. So if up here, it only said it didn't have it listed as additional insured, you're just a certificate holder, so there's no teeth there. So you want to make sure that you get the additional insured listed there and they send you the endorsement with it and that it gets signed. That's always good to have a signed certificate of insurance. Um, other items that you may want to consider, again, these are, you know, when you're building contracts, it's called primary non-contributory wording. And I'm just going to jump down to here. It says this means that the vendor's policy must pay other applicable policies primary and without seeking contribution from other policies. Basically saying if there's an issue, the vendor's going to pay first and we're not going to be, we're not going to have anybody else contribute to this claim. And the other one is a waiver of subrogation. It's basically saying that if my policy pays out, but you're wrong, I can come back and sue you. That's called subrogation. When you waive that, you're saying, hey, insurance company, you can't go back and sue anybody. And so this verbiage can be very powerful and I think it's re really great to have in, in, um, in contracts. Um, and here's what it would look like, you know, a certificate holder and it shows the form, has waiver of subrogation, primary and non-contributory in favor of the certificate holder. So this is where the description is gonna be of what you have covered. Okay, um, look, I'm just gonna get through this. Sorry, I'll send this out to you so you can have it. Oh, here's a little ending thing. It says, I think if you misunderstood, the million dollar umbrella policy only covers you for claims involving an umbrella. And so sometimes we get this perspective of insurance people, and this is what happens in claims. The biggest thing, just be aware so that you don't have some issue come up you know, we're going, oh yeah, well that only involves umbrella claims. And then for contacts, um, you have Larry Allred, uh, Insurance Canopy is a, a company of ours that um, caters to uh, direct to the consumer. And then you have Troy that's, you know, showing himself here. Um, wave, wave there, Troy. So, and that's it. I'm sorry I had to blow through there. There's a lot of information to cover, um, but I appreciate your time and I'll be happy to join, join you in, a, in another room and answer any questions you have. Thank you guys.